I am Paul Combs. I am the elder for worship here at Christ Presbyterian Church. Welcome to worship. I have a few announcements for you. Isn't it great, the fellowship? I love it. Thank you. So just a couple of announcements. Uh, Saturday, July 20th at 1130, uh, Christ Presbyterian Women Potluck provided entree hot dogs. Please bring picnic sides or desserts. Um, the program, Our Christian Heritage, presented by Ann Rice, wear red, white, and blue to have a late 4th of July celebration, and guests are welcome. There's a sign-up sheet on the information table or call Dottie. Her phone number is in the bulletin and leave a message if she doesn't answer. Uh, the second announcement, Women's Summer Saturday Bible Study. It meets on Saturdays at 10.30 a.m. Uh, the book being studied is called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Ortland. The study is led by Beth Bayliss. Um, for, for, for more information, you can call Julie Smith. Her number is in the bulletin, too. Now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Before our call to worship this morning, we have a tradition to sing happy, happy birthday once you hit 90 in the congregation. Uh, and so Fran turned 90 three weeks ago, and I missed it <coughs> all three weeks, so I have publicly apologized to Fran. However, uh, but let's all rise, and we're going to sing happy birthday to Fran. So kids, Fran, we're singing happy birthday to Fran, so you guys can sing. All right. Happy Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear friend, happy birthday to you. And nobody on the live stream wants to hear me sing, so I turn my mic back on. Happy birthday, Fran. <laughs> All right, now if you turn your attention to this morning's call to worship. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, in name. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortal, thanks and sing in triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. God of truth and love, when he had purged our stains, he took his seat above, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Jesus given. 
turn your attention behind me on the screen for this morning's prayer of confession. Please pray with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Friends in Christ, know that you are forgiven by our eternal King, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his work on the cross. Hear these words of assurance from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thanks be to God. This morning, Emery Combs is going to be our reader for catechism. What is sin? Sin is disobeying or not conforming to God's law in any way.
be seated. All right, so at this time, we are not going to have the traditional pastoral prayer today, but we are going to have a presentation of a quilt. So if the Meadows family would come forward, at least Michael knows about this. So Mallory, if you could actually just you come forward in the baby. I know. Or do you want Wells? We're in Idaho. We're very loosey goosey (laughs) with stuff. So All right, and if those who are involved in making this quilt would come forward as well. I thought you forgot. I did not forget, no? (laughs) All right, so um, what we normally do is uh, we present the quilt. So you got it if you want to. So those who worked on this one, so we have uh, Karen Hintz, Diana Lees, Jeannie, and Karen. Uh, And if Here's the quilt, so uh, it's an extension. Yes, we will, but if you'd give it to them and then that way we can snap a picture. We got to do things for Facebook, right? (laughs) So Paula Tonkin, if she's, where? oh, there you are. If you could take a picture, that'd be great. And then the whole congregation can see as well. Yeah. So at this time, we're going to pray for the quilt. And so I don't go back to the pastoral prayer. We'll end in the Lord's Prayer. So just kind of follow my lead. So yes, go ahead, read. Okay. Lovingly made by the Peace Comfort Quilting Group of Christ Presbyterian Church. I don't know why I'm choked up. <laughs> <laughs> Presented to Eloise Jane Meadow, born May 23rd, 2024. May she see this quilt as a symbol of God's love. We pray that Eloise will always remember her loving Savior's words. Let the little children come to me and and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Matthew 19, 14. And we can give a round of applause to the group for making that. It's lovely. (laughs) All right. And now, as we traditionally do, if you'd extend out a hand and we will pray for the blessing of the quilt. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the work of the quilting group today and all the, the hands that it took to make this as, we are, as they are the hands and extension of your body. Lord, as I was hearing Karen read those words, uh, the idea of your covenant love directed towards your children filled my, my hearts with gladness and rejoicing. So I pray, Lord, all the days of Eloise's life uh, that you would use this quilt, metaphorically so to speak, to wrap her in your love. Um, that she would trust your, in your son at a young age and confirm her baptism, that she would walk in your ways, and as she grows to know you more and walks deeply with you, may she serve your kingdom and may she serve her neighbor. Finally, we pray the words that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And now we can give another round of applause. Great work, guys. And now let us continue to worship our Lord, by giving him our tithes and offerings.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, as we give these gifts to you in response to your gospel of grace, May they be used to proclaim that your son is kinged. May they be used to advance your kingdom. And may all we say or do in response to you uh, be one of thanksgiving. May our hearts be filled with gladness to give to, the, to your work, both here and throughout the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Greg Rutherford, and the New Testament reading today is from Acts 1, 6 through 11. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Let us pray. Lord God, we wish to see Jesus. By your Spirit's power, give us eyes to see his glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the season that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be, witnesses, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, and they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come the same way you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. All right, uh, before I read Psalm 47, let us pray. Lord, as we come into your presence this morning to hear you speak to us, may you soften our hearts, and may we be aware that your Holy Spirit is present and that he seeks to speak to us. Lord, may you speak to your people, and may we be forever transformed. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Again, Psalm 47 is our text today. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all of the earth. He has subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the trumpet, sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations, he sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God, he is highly exalted. The word of the Lord. All right, this morning, uh, before I open up, I'd like to share a quick quote, which I think is sort of funny, tongue in cheek, um, and lines up well with our sermon. Um, that kind of crossed my mind at the end, but um, it's from the late John Richard Newhouse. So I, I'm a avid reader of the great magazine called First Things. Um, if anybody's heard, seems like nobody's heard of it. First Things is great. I highly recommend it. Uh, but the founder had this really funny quote. Whenever I meet God, I will do so as an American. And uh, I love that quote um, because it really pushes back against this idea that we can transcend the place and time where we were born and 
to be honest, that is so American to actually think that you can do that too. So those of us who have served on the mission field, I know, or lived in another country growing up, you know what I'm talking about here, all right? Uh, so hopefully everybody enjoyed the 4th of July. Uh, nobody does fireworks quite like the great state of Idaho, and you all might be uh, kind of uh, recoiling and responding to all the PTSD that you have from fireworks in your street, right? Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and our dogs might too. So um, yeah, so anyways, it was a blessed 4th of July and great. Uh, and perhaps on our minds in the last couple of days has been the theme of patri patriotism. So patriotism and how that works out. Now, patriotism in the United States has kind of fallen on hard times. And I, I went to some data to kind of think through this. Um, a couple years ago, a Gallup poll found that only 20% of people consented to the idea of being extremely proud of being an American, um, which is an interesting data point. Um, and proves again, a theme that comes up in my uh, sermons from time to time is that institutions in America are quite weak and that's why we have all this polarization. So many of you would, would know this. But there's a lot of factors that go into, I think, being patriotic or proud. Uh, and one of them can be things such as your socioeconomic status, the world that you inherited when you were born uh, can and sometimes be an indicator of how patriotic you are. So I'm gonna use both of my grandfathers for, as an example, which I have used before, but it's worth bringing up. Um, sometimes those are more, pa people are more patriotic that didn't go to college. I went to college like myself and didn't serve, but my grandfathers, like I just mentioned, did not, did not go to college. And when you grew up in Southwestern Pennsylvania and you were 18, you had two options when they were growing up. You could work in the mills, which was awful, or you could go serve in the Navy, Army, or Marines. My grandfather, for example, I asked him, why did you become, uh, why did you serve in the Navy? And he said to me, Dougie, that is, that's what I'm called in my family because my dad has the same name. And I got called that last week a lot because my family was in town. But he said, Dougie, you ha I had two options when I was a boy. I could go clean the insides of where they made steel in Pittsburgh, or I could join the armed services. And he said, after four weeks of graduating high school and cleaning the inside of the mill and putting the special suit on, I was like, it's time to sign up for the Navy. <laughs> and what's interesting about that also is I've reflected on my grandfather, who's quite patriotic in a, in a good way. Um, it was kind of the normal average man's pathway to do a lot of cool things. Like he got to travel the world. He lived in Alaska, he lived in Japan. Um, he got credit for serving in the Korean War, even though he didn't actually do anything. As he would say, he just kind of sat on a boat. Or that's his words. Um, but it was kind of his college experience. Uh, and if that was the most formative time in your life to set you up for the rest of your life from 18 to 25, I can see why my grandfather is incredibly patriotic. The nation was great to him and gave him this great experience. Um, hence why he's patriotic. And I will say that Idaho's not 25% proud of America, it's like 99% proud. So much so that we were on the playground the other day and we saw a guy with a giant American flag tattooed on his back and his shirt was off and I thought, wow, that's very Idaho. But we have a lot of, we have a lot of veterans. I don't know if I would authorize doing that, but it's, it's here at the Valley. So I want to affirm this morning that love of nation and home in particular is a good thing. And I think it's okay to do that. It's also okay to love the whole Western tradition. And in many ways, that's what the 4th of July is all about. Um, just to, to tee it up for how the nations see us as Americans, I had the good pleasure of baptizing a good friend who was a neighbor from Turkey a couple years ago. I've mentioned him before. But what was fascinating to me is as we worked through the creed and through the Bible and he became a Christian, he was an engineer and he's like, I'm ready, I, I wanna be baptized. And I'm like, are you sure about this? He's like, I know everything I need to know. Like an engineer, he said, I just need to be baptized. I'm like, absolutely. But as I would talk to him, he would often state that he not only saw becoming an, a Christian as a deeply personal thing in his life, he also saw the United States of America operating in this kind of Christian tradition. And he especially loved 
how our nation treated individuals and welcomed people from other countries. He's, he saw it as a really good thing. And so what was interesting is you can't neatly divide out him becoming a Christian while him also becoming probably more American than I am, honestly. Um, one of the things that he did after he got baptized a month afterwards is buy a, a handgun, which we're in Idaho. That's kind of funny, I think, although he wasn't in Idaho. Um, he had no interest in going back to this kind of Turkish idea of a secular Islamic republic. Um, he wanted to be an American, and he will be one day. And I like to share that story because it's a great example of how America is quite welcoming, welcoming to people that are very different than us in terms of where they were born. Now, I'd like to go in a slightly different direction and dissent from some unhealthy ideas of Americanism as well. Um, we are exceptional and different as a nation, um, but we don't have a covenant with the Lord like ancient Israel did. So sometimes Americans kind of explicitly say this. Um, we are not the, uh, God's chosen nation to bring redemption to the rest of the world. I will just state that. You can even go back to my eschatology class on YouTube, and I spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, What's fascinating about America's birth as a nation, which many of us celebrated, is there are actually even many different competing and compelling views of our founding. So if you want the kind of Puritan vision where we're a, holy, uh, we're a city set on a hill, holy, and we have this covenant with God, you can find that in the Puritans. And this is actually, most of us, I see us shaking our heads, most of us are very um, aware of this tradition. In fact, most of our public schools pushed this up until recently. But you could just as equally find secular views of America, too, and people that celebrate it as well. So that's kind of the weird thing about celebrating with your neighbors. Depending on where they are in life, they might have different, we might have differing views on the American experience, and that's just life. You could also go in a newer direction, which I've found. I, I like history, and there are some scholars of America who argue that we're more like an empire than a nation. Um, which I find compelling because I lived in Mexico for two years, and even though I was out of the United States, the United States kind of tentacles was all over Mexico. I remember talking to a guy in my dad's warehouse one time, and he said, I love America because you can go into the supermarket and pick out 50 different kinds of toothpaste. And I said to him, <laughs> Jeff, you know you can do that in Mexico as well. And he's like, really? I thought America was unique in that way. I was like, no, the supermarket was born here, but it's all over the world now. And he was kind of just like dumbfounded by that. Um, but I want to ask the question, what does scripture say about all of this, especially again as patriotism is perhaps on our mind and has dominated our weekend? Well, Psalm 47 is going to push us as a congregation, I think, to think outside of the box. It might subvert our expectations of where this, you thought the sermon was perhaps headed. So in that way, it's God's providential hand leading us through a psalm to think about the great birth of our nation. The word nation is repeated several times in Psalm 47. In fact, five times, if my count's right. Now, what's fascinating about our context in America is that the nations are coming to us. And I think this has profound implications for the local church, our presbytery, and even our denomination. Because our denomination's on my mind because I went to General Assembly a couple weeks ago. So let's use Idaho as an example for how the nations are coming to America, which I sound very Protestant even saying that. So in the fiscal year of 2023, we had 1,200 refugees resettle in the state of Idaho. That's a lot uh, given our population. The data of nations represented are very broad. We have Hispanics, we have Arabs, we have Africans, and we have several different Asian countries. If you want to go from that abstract data point to concrete, just go to your local playground or to the mall and you will experience all the nations and languages around you. Um, if you want to go to the mall in particular, we often joke in our family that the Hispanics uh, are keeping the malls afloat in America because it's like 70% of the population when you walk around the mall. Like us white people, who goes to the mall anymore? But all the Hispanics are keeping it afloat. At least that's our group text chat in my family. So these folks uh, that come to us are our neighbors, 
You eat all their food at their local restaurants. Often immigrants come to the United States and what do they do? They open up a restaurant. Or as my close Korean friend used to say, Koreans don't open up restaurants, they open up Presbyterian churches, which I thought was really funny. If you're compelled to be both a Christian who serves their neighbor and be a good citizen, you can do both at the same time. You can even help kids learn English at Capitol High School. Many of us do this in the fall and in the spring. Now, Christians in the United States also have traditionally spent a good chunk of change to send missionaries overseas. Uh, we used to be the most sending nation per capita, and last time I checked, I think it might be Korea, or at least that's what my Korean friends told me. But what do we do when the nations are coming to us? Um, I think we need to think about that, and it's one of the conversational partners that I want us to have in Psalm 47. We could have an outreach to immigrants in the Treasure Valley. We can actually even witness the Lord conquer the nations, which is a important verse, uh, verse 3, uh, in our midst. We can see people from other nations come to saving faith in the eternal King, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that long opening out of the way, let's start engage, engaging with Psalm 47. All right, so there is three moves in Psalm 47. The first move is God is king, so which we sang a lot about today. So if you want to hear one phrase over and over again, it's God is king. The second one is praise, or we might say praise to the king. And finally, the last move in section three is the God of Abraham and how that plays itself out. All right, so in verse one of Psalm 47, we have a series of commands, much like a loving heavenly father speaking to his children. Good parenting means that you learned how to give, not commands where you begrudge your children, but just commands. Hey, do this. Hey, do that. It's for your flourishing, right? So God speaks to us and says, clap your hands, all peoples. We clapped in worship today. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Those are commands. Now the explanation comes in verse two. For the Lord, that's the covenant name of God, Yahweh, the Most High, which was our theme last week, God is high and lifted up, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Does verse 2 say that God is just king over Israel? No. It says God is king over all the earth. That word earth or land plays a huge part in our Old Testament. But what's super striking about verse 2 is it speaking about the king ruling over all the earth, not just a small piece of land in the Middle East. Um, and we'll hold that on for a thought. We're going to talk about how Christ fulfills that verse in particular. Verse 3, he subdued, or we might say conquered, the peoples under us. Uh, God is the one doing the action in verse 3. In fact, it's kind of almost obnoxiously so that God is the one doing this work. He subdues the nations under our feet. He, I hope you can hear in verse 3 the conquering language, and it also channels Psalm 2 as well. Um, and you can also see why during Jesus's earthly ministry, when the Jews are confused about uh, his kingdom being not of this earth and how the nations will be conquered, you could see easily in verse 3 as that being uh, seen as a kind of violent subduing. Does everybody tracking with me there? But we're going to ask the question, how does the eternal king, the Lord Jesus, conquer the nations? So hold on to that. Verse 4, he chose our heritage for us, the nations, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. So Jacob, you could swap out Israel there. It's God's covenant love that he has chosen them as a people to be a priesthood of all nations and to be a light to the world, and that through Israel, through their king, all the nations would be conquered and all the nations would be blessed. Now, from five to seven, we start to move into this series of praises. Um, verse five, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord, the covenant name for God, with the sound of a trumpet. I don't think Michael plays the trumpet, so unfortunately we couldn't have that today. Or else all of you would be killing me because you have hearing aids, and that would just not work in our, in our uh, little space, right? Verse 6, we are told to sing several times. See, one, two, three, four. Uh, four times we are told to sing praises to God. Why do we sing praises to God? Because he is king over all of the earth. 
as is, as is explained in verse 7. Sing praises to God with a psalm. So the response, as we are all people of the nations in this room, whether we know it or not, the response to the eternal king is thanksgiving to God for who he is. Sometimes when you walk away from going to church on Sunday, the best thing and the, or the best takeaway that you can have is just that we praise God because he is king over all the universe. You want to have a big God? Come to church and, pra and praise him like that. Sometimes that's just what we need to hear, especially in hard times. Verse 8, we are affirmed again that God is king, if you haven't heard that enough, uh, that he reigns over the nations, right? Reigns and rules. He sits, that's an important word, um, on his holy throne. Both reigns and sits are past action with continuous results. In other words, the nations are continuing to be subdued under the eternal king. It's not just for the nation of Israel. Uh, who sits at God the Father's right hand? Christ. Verse 9, the princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. Why would the psalmist re reference Abraham in verse 9? Anybody want to take a crack and yell at the pastor? Uh, Abraham, unlike, say, Moses, when we went through the Ten Commandments, is a universal figure. Um, in his seed, all the nations would be blessed. Um, Genesis 12, 15, and 17. For those of us who have been here since we took a year and a half to work through Romans, did I talk about Abraham a lot? Yeah, I did, because Paul was obsessed with Abraham. And Paul is convinced, rightfully so, that through the seed of Abraham, we have Jesus, our eternal king, and all the nations are coming under his rule and reign. So a Jewish person in, say, the first century, or when this was originally penned, might see the king coming and just beating up the bad guys, the Gentiles, right, and subduing them. Well, I think the proper interpretation is that Christ would come and that he would subdue the nations through his gospel ministry. And in response, we see all of this kind of warrior-like language for the shields of the earth belong to God, and we conclude with he is highly exalted. In other words, as God is subduing the nations before us, what are the nations to do? What is their purpose? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. All right, so we've worked through our Old Ta Testament passage and our sermon text. We don't want to just leave it alone and interpret it like it's locked away in history. This is a living, uh, God's word is living and active. I'd like to bring our New Testament text uh, that Greg so delightfully read. I was confused, Greg, you shaved off your beard today. I didn't even notice you for, there for a second. But he did, a, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but he did a great job reading Acts 1, 6 through 11, and I deliberately had that picked on purpose because it's a passage in the book of Acts where we see our Lord, uh, rise. he rises up to the right hand of God the Father, and what is he in that passage, or what is he portrayed as? The king. He's the eternal king. In other words, he fulfills our psalm this morning. Even though I would say Psalm 47 really channels Psalm 2. Um, psalm 2 is directly referenced a lot more in the New Testament, but I think they kind of go together, so you can do both at the same time. Now in that passage, what do Christ, follow, Christ followers ask um, to the Lord? They say this, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's like they got his interpretation, his ministry completely wrong at that point in time. Now, the eternal king, the Lord Jesus Christ, basically answers no and then goes on to talk about something different, which he does a lot in his ministry. Um, and he goes on to speak about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is going to equip them to do the work to which they've been called. They are going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, which is the spirit, we could still call Jerusalem the spiritual capital of the world. Uh, Judea and Samaria, Samaria and to the what? The ends of the earth. Christ eternal king as he fulfills Psalm 47 and 2 and Psalm 110, which I think uh, Michael's gonna preach on in a couple weeks. 
if I believe, if I'm correct? Yep, okay, good. My memory is working okay today. Um, his kingdom is gonna be extended to all. King Jesus, who is also the last Adam, uh, is taking back all that is his. And what was promised to Adam was not just, again, a small piece of land in the Middle East, but the whole entire earth. And what did Adam do? He failed. What, what, what does the last Adam doing? He's reversing the curse, right? Now here is the kicker, and this is the really extraordinary thing. His work is being accomplished through his followers. Do, the, do these followers, us this morning, accomplish the mission on our own? Absolutely not. We do so through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's this saying that we like to repeat, I like to repeat to session, and they're gonna hear it again, not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday after. Who builds his church? The Lord builds his church, right? It's the Lord's action, and he's using us as vessels uh, to expand his role and reign. So the Lord, uh, Lord's son, uh, who sits at his right hand, is the eternal king. Here are these really interesting words in John's gospel about doing great work through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 13. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do more works than I do. And that's a pretty remarkable thing. It's, again, all done through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Son of God, the eternal king, goes to sit at God the Father's right hand. That means he is king. Um, that, that's what it means to be at the right hand. And as he ascends to the throne, who descends? The Holy Spirit. Uh, what is the job description of the Holy Spirit? To always point back to Jesus. That's why he's often referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Every work that the, that the Holy Spirit does is to point us to Jesus. So in our application section today, I wanna ask three items or drill down on three items that come to us from Psalm 47 and interpret it on this side of salvation history. So first, what we wanna do is see that Jesus clearly fulfills Psalm 47. He is the eternal Davidic king. Second, I want to ask the question uh, in our particular church, how does this king subdue the nations here in the Treasure Valley? In other words, bless you. Uh, in other words, how is this passage coming to life? And thirdly, I want to ask the question, what do we do with the middle section that is all about praise? Um, and the reason why I'm jumbling them up a little bit is because Psalms are poetry, so they don't follow in sequential order but a sermon has to be in sequential order, so I'm putting the, third sec the second section last for our purposes so we can organize our thoughts. All right, so the first item of business is the king. Uh, again, Psalm 47 channels Psalm 2, uh, and Psalm 2 was the coronation psalm that was sung and read whenever the new Davidic king each time would be installed. Um, scholars argue that Psalm 47 is channeling that tradition. And the Psalms had a liturgical function. In other words, you would hear them often in the synagogue about once a month, if memory serves me correctly. And so from time to time, uh, they were organized in such a way that you would hear Psalm 47 in the synagogue, and where would your mind go to? Psalm two, and you would know to pray for your king. Um, but the Davidic king, was never meant to just be this temporal idea, like just of this earth. It always pointed out outside of itself to an eternal reality and purpose. All the nations would worship the Lord through this king that would come in the future. This was true for nations that came and paid homage to the king on their own accord, and it was also gonna be true for, for nations that didn't come on their own accord, that the, nation, that the Lord would, in fact, conquer them and rule and reign over them. What's clear in this tradition is that God providentially rules over the nations through this king. And who is doing this right now at this time as we speak? Jesus. Jesus is the eternal king. You know, we're in a divided country, and sometimes Christians want to act politically, uh, right? As everybody on the same page. You know what the most political thing you can do as a Christian is? Come to church. <laughs> Sometimes people miss this, and they stop going to church and just go out and do their own thing, and they want to take back the land for the Lord, so to speak. But when we come to church, we are acknowledging that Jesus is king 
each and every Sunday that we are worshiping him. And what do we do at Christ Prez? We worship, walk, and serve. So if you want to start with the first place of business and be political for Jesus, what do you do? You worship him, then you walk with him in formation, and then you serve him. That's important. Session did that on purpose. How does the king subdue the nations in verse 3? I think it's through the ministry of the word. Uh, Paul believed this, and I'd like to channel him here, that Christ conquers the nations through the proclamation of his gospel. Hear Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 25. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the full foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So again, if you want to be political for the Lord, what do you do? You preach and proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he fulfills such passages like ours this morning. The interesting thing about our king is where does he sit enthroned upon? He sits enthroned upon a cross. Um, that's really interesting. The cross is Christ's throne. The cross is where the sin of the world was dealt with by God. The cross is where we see Christ's throne defined by grace and mercy, so that he's enthroned upon a cross. And if you read, say, Mark's gospel, you can see that, that he's presenting it that way. But for our purposes this morning, who is brought together by the cross in that, that little snippet that I read from Paul? Jew and Gentile, just like our passage in Psalm 47. Those who historically hated each other um, are brought near by the cross of Christ, as our eternal King David, the Lord Jesus Christ, is enthroned. Are the Jews any better than the Gentiles? No. You should say no. Don't say yes, please. <laughs> Are the Gentiles so corrupted by idolatry, unclean, and degenerate, which Paul actually thought, I'm convinced, that God cannot repair, redeem, and restore them? Absolutely not. Uh, the cosmic king of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ, who sits upon his throne, has destroyed the wall between Jews and Gentiles and has built a new kingdom. But here's the interesting thing. He seeks to do the same today. And for the first century, Jew and Gentile divide was big, but any arbitrary boundary that we put up uh, between one another as Christians or to those who are outside the kingdom right now must be destroyed. What counts is that people trust in the universal king for eternal salvation. All right, so we got king out of the way. Now we have kingdom. The king has a kingdom. Uh, this year, just to, to note, just as things are coming, we're already in July, so fall programming is going to come up quicker than we realize. Every year in my life, it, time just kind of flies by, right? Um, we're going to focus as a congregation on seeing the Lord expand his kingdom through the Alpha program. So we're going to have a video next week, and Michael's been working on that. So that's going to be for the spiritually curious, or perhaps those who want to, uh, are coming back to church. A lot of people are coming back to church post-COVID. So Wednesday nights, mark your calendar. Um, so what I'm trying to do in this applicational point is not so much for the here and now, but it's an aspirational Point, and I'm going to talk about ministry to immigrants. So what do we do as a congregation when the nations come to us? When some people from the most unreached countries in the world actually live in our backyards? Do we ignore that reality as a congregation? The answer is no again, so don't say yes. <laughs> um, I'll take one people group that I've ran into a lot in the Treasure Valley, which is historically kind of an unreached group, which is people from Afghanistan. Um, I've run into to kids uh, at Capitol High School as we volunteer. That's a, a big part. So um, three, three girls that come to mind in particular. Um, so we, a bunch of us help them uh, learn English. And I've also seen all these restaurants pop up too. Has everybody seen Afghani restaurants pop up? If you haven't, drive to our old office on Ustick and there's one right across the street. Um, which I believe Sarah has been to and aff affirmed. So go there. Uh, the Lord seeks again to uh, subdue the nations, I believe, here in the Treasure Valley, Psalm 47, 4. Uh, local churches should not miss this opportunity that is near and dear to us. 
So at General Assembly a couple weeks ago, um, so that's the denominational meeting where all of our churches get together. Um, you sign up for all these workshops. It's exhausting. Um, but one stuck out to me that I wanted to go to on behalf of our church, which was ministering to your refugee neighbors in your backyard. And the reason why I signed up for that was because Mark and MJ Vanderput, who we support as missionaries as a church, were putting on that particular uh, workshop. Now, what's interesting about the Vanderputs is that they serve Muslims in the Detroit metro area. I believe they're in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a little bit north, which it's like 90% Muslim, I believe. Um, so they're commissioned by the sending arm of the EPC, World Outreach, to do work with them. And in this workshop, they shared stories of working particularly with men from Afghanistan. And what they did was they worked with local like NGO, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and met them as they got off the plane. They helped them find a place to live. They make sure they get shelter. Uh, they make sure they get food, clothes, on and on and on. Um, their primary mode of evangelism was English, so they teach them English. And really, it was kind of, I can't ever say this when you make the word together, fran fringe evangelism, like being just a friend. You kind of get what I'm saying, a comp compound word. It doesn't roll off my tongue well, so I apologize. Um, it was simply just being a friend and being there for them. Now, I'd love to see, as I walked away from this, the Vanderputs come to tre the Treasure Valley and run a workshop, which I think we tried to do in the past, but it, it didn't work out, but we can do it again. Let's persevere, that's a good virtue. Um, and what impressed me so much about the Vanderputs were that they wanted to share the verbal gospel with their, their neighbors. Sometimes missionaries recently have noticed a hesitancy to actually share the verbal gospel with them. Now, on the plane ride home from General Assembly, I thought to myself, this could probably be replicated here at Christ Pres down the road. The opportunities are so vast in our context and I thought maybe we could even have a world outreach worker in Idaho, because a few of our churches are close enough together. Um, so I'm gonna put pressure on some of our pastors in Idaho, and you should too, whenever you see them at Presbytery in October. So we'll see, um, at least that's my prayer. I could be wrong, but I'm gonna say that I'm right, so, <laughs> right? All right, so that's the kingdom. How does the king expand his kingdom? Finally, uh, we have a life of praise, which is really the heart and the center of the psalm. So what's the proper response from us when the king conquers our heart through the proclamation of gospel and the spirit brings us into the kingdom of God as we worship, walk, and serve the Lord? What life becomes about is not so much me and my glory, but it becomes about glorifying the Lord and enjoying him forever. Now, during my study this past week, I only have two commentaries on Psalms, which is kind of sad. I usually have a lot more, but I only had two this week and couldn't get another one in time. So I was stuck with a contemporary person and John Calvin. So I was reading John Calvin's commentary on Psalm 47. And what's interesting about John Calvin is he kind of has this rap for being obsessed with predestination. Has anybody heard this? That was not true. He just assumed what was taught by the church for centuries. He was, in my best estimation, I've read a lot of them, he kind of loved two things. He liked to talk about the Christian life being one of thanksgiving, and he also liked to talk about union with Christ. That He talks about that like all the time in his institutes and in his commentaries. Well, surprise, surprise, when he was interpreting Psalm 47, he went on and on and on and on about the Christian life being one of thanksgiving and gratitude. And the interesting thing is I know a little bit more about Calvin than maybe he brought out in the text. This is, again, coming from someone who had chronic health problems most of his life. He lost his only son in infancy. His wife died after only being married for about eight years. And some biographers think he lost as many as eight uh, daughters in infancy as well. None of his children that were born actually were raised um, up by him. In fact, when his wife died, she was married before. He, he actually played a, a fatherly role in her son's lives as well. Here's Calvin with that much trauma in life, which is a kind of thing that a lot of people talk about now, responding to that and saying the Christian life is to be one of thanksgiving and praise. Um, I was just flabbergasted by that, and it was so challenging to read his words. 
Now, what I'd like to do in thinking about praise is take Psalm 47, uh, Calvin's commentary, and the movie Inside Out 2 and bring it into our conversation. So if you're looking for a good summer movie to go see this week, go see Inside Out 2. It's really, really good, and it's cute. And it's not just for little kids. It's for people of all ages. So um, now in, in the movie Inside Out 2, there's these characters which are emotions personified, and they govern. It's really a movie about neuroscience, and which is great because I know my science education goes to about high school, so I don't know science very well. But you have these competing emotions that fight for control of the brain. There's like a, all these levers and stuff. It's really, really cute, and it makes a lot of sense, at least from a popular side. The assumption in the film is that certain emotions govern and control our brains. Can everybody affirm that? Is everybody tracking with me so far? Now, in the first Inside Out, the governing emotion is joy, which if you spent a lot of time around children who grow up in a functional home, what is the emotion that dominates children? Joy. Our Lord says to be like children and come into the kingdom of God. I often wonder if that's because they're so joyful uh, in life. Now, in the second Inside Out, um, Riley, the main character, is going through puberty, and this new emotion shows up on the scene called anxiety. And anxiety is a big thing for teenagers and why teenagers are so awkward sometimes to be around. And I won't give much more of the movie away, but in this second installment of Inside Out, there's a battle between joy and anxiety. And it's a, it's a battle for who is going to control Riley's brain. And you can go to the movie and find out. It's a really interesting ending. Again, I would recommend it. Now, as I sat there and watched this film, I thought about Psalm 47, as a pastor does, I guess. And I thought, there's a lot of wisdom to the idea that in our Christian life, what should be the dominant emotion that should kind of control our brain? I think thanksgiving and praise. Um, that should be the one that should control our brain. And that doesn't mean that I'm being dismiss dismissive about emotions such as anger, anxiety, and fear. The great thing about the Psalms is, are all those emotions dealt with? Absolutely. There's even the imprecatory Psalms, which are really pretty grisly, and sometimes we're embarrassed they're there. But they're there. They can be prayed. God wants to engage all of our emotions, but here is Psalm 47, I think, challenging us to say we should ground our lives in gratitude, thanksgiving, and praise. So in the movie Inside Out 2, joy and anxiety are battling, but I actually think thanksgiving and praise are battling out in our brain. And Calvin would say to us this morning, thanksgiving and praise to the eternal king is to be that which governs your brain. If you ground your life in that, it doesn't mean all of life is going to be ro rosy and pretty, but I think trauma and all the hard stuff that we deal with as an in individuals uh, will be able to persevere and get through. Is everybody tracking with me there? All right, that's some good uh, pastoral wisdom from Calvin. So in closing, as you go about your week, remember that the Lord rules over the nations. Keep in mind that Jesus is king. Also keep in mind that Jesus is building his eternal king through the proclamation of his gospel. Finally, keep in mind that the Christian life is to be grounded in thanksgiving to the king. All good gifts come from the king's right hands to us. We live a life of obedience to the king out of thanksgiving and gratitude. So next week, we'll open up the Psalms again, and we're going to engage with Psalm 50, and we're going to take God as king and bring it into conversation with God as judge. Um, which is an interesting topic. So I look forward to opening up the word of life with you next week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the good news of your gospel. Uh, we thank you that your son fulfills Psalm 47, that in fact he is king. We also pray, Lord, and Thank you for the fact that you are subduing the nations right before our very eyes through the proclamation of your son's gospel, that the spirit indeed builds your church and, your, and expands your kingdom. Lord, finally, help us to be a church that is animated and filled with a spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude. Um, life is hard. Many storms come our way, as we learned last week. 
Um, but one thing is clear, that you remain our fortress. And Lord, no matter what storms come our way in life, may we be grounded in your gospel and in response be overwhelmed with gratitude and thanksgiving. And may your Holy Spirit allow those virtues to carry us forward, no matter what we face in life. May Christ Presbyterian Church here in Garden City in the Treasure Valley and Boise Metro be a congregation that is always filled with gratitude uh, for the gift that we have received in Christ. And may that gift compel us to go and share it with others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So at this time, we're going to have an instrumental today. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, liturgy is like a dance, right? And I'm so used to the dance that, uh, that we've been doing for a long time until Michael came that I keep making a lot of mistakes. So um, at this time, um, Michael is going to play an instrumental song. So I'd ask you just to uh, prepare your hearts for the table, close your eyes, and uh, he'll play for us. And then after he's done, we will turn our attention to the Heidelberg Catechism. So if you just close your, close your eyes and quiet your heart before the Lord. you would turn your attention to the screen behind me. Um, we are going to use Heidelberg. We haven't had Heidelberg in a while because I kind of forgot about it, but it's worth to bring forward again to the Lord's table as we traditionally have. So I have a question. You have an answer. Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has pulled fully for my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over in such a way that not one hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Now, as we come to the Lord's table today, and you know, honestly, you could read that question and answer and just close up shop because it is so well written in terms of summarizing what the Christian life is all about. But before we come to the table this morning, I want to recognize that Christ is king, right? We heard loud and proud what that is all about this morning. And for those who are invited to the Lord's table this morning, if you believe in Jesus and have been baptized, you are to come forward and to receive God's grace. Now, as we come to the table today, I want to think back quickly through king, kingdom, and praise and bring it into conversation with the Lord's table. Who is the king of this table right now? Jesus. Who is to come to his table? Those who are part of his kingdom. For Christ's uh, first century context, that was Jew and Gentile. For our context now, that is all nations, anyone in this room who professes faith in Christ. Finally, as we come to the Lord's table, be reminded that a table is a place of eating and dining. And are people to have fun at, at, when they eat together? Yes. Uh, and the Lord's table is a table of celebration. We celebrate what Christ did for us. Our king, who is upon the cross, purchased eternal life for us. 
And is heaven going to be a drab and boring experience for all of eternity? No, it's going to be a time of rejoicing and celebrating forever. It's going to be like the best dinner party that you ever attended times like a million. I'm just kind of throwing that out there today. So let us uh, pray before uh, I read the words of institution. Lord, as we come into your presence today to receive the sacrament uh, of the supper, help us to understand and remember that Christ died for us. He died uh, for our sins. He stood in our place. Help us to also understand as we come to the table this morning that through our union with your son that we are brought into deeper fellowship. There truly is something mysterious given to us through the work of your spirit. You draw us into deeper union and communion with you and transform us. Finally, Lord, as we come to the table today, help us to be a people who are hopeful that this world is not all that there is, but there is a new world that will come in the, in the age when heaven comes to earth, when everything is united, uh, and we finally see the king of our heart face to face. Help that Help us, Lord, for that hope to ground us and animate us as Christians, and may we be compelled to share that with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For I delivered, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And now at this time, I'd ask you as the congregation, as you are prompted by the Holy Spirit to take the, your bread and feast upon the bread of life, our Lord Jesus Christ, through faith. And now if you would peel back uh, your cup and to signify unity that we are all part of God's kingdom here in this room, I will say the gifts of God for the people of God and your response as the congregation will be thanks be to God. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your grace that is given to us at your table. Help us to think and ponder this week about the deep mystery that is before our very eyes. Help us to think and ponder about the saving work of your gospel. Help us to think and ponder how your sacrament draws us into deeper union and communion with your son. And help us, Lord, to be a congregation that is shaped by thanksgiving and gratitude. May that be the governing force of our lives, even when the storm comes, that this world may be difficult and we're going through a lot of hard things, but in the age to come, uh, all wars will cease, all tears will cease, and we will see our beloved King Jesus face to face. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls belong? Who holds our days within his hand? What comes apart from his command? And what will keep 
help us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore the rock of Christ oh sing hallelujah our old spring eternal oh sing hallelujah now and Christ our hope and life and death Unto the grave what will we sing Christ he lives Christ he lives and what reward will heaven bring everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet the Lord then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess christ our hope in life and death oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death. Receive God's blessing and benediction upon you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. What is your mission? We go forth in the power of the Spirit to serve God's world as the head, heart, and hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, blessings upon all of you. You're invited to have fellowship afterwards. However, I am told we're having a cake for the meadows that they get the first piece. So if you would be, you would part the Red Sea so that they can get to the cake, I'd appreciate it. Thank you.